have nothing to offer but blood, toil, tears, and sweat. こんにちは、みなさん。Welcome to. <coughs> Sorry about that. Welcome to Shogun History. Today, we'll be looking at a movie that gave me the idea to start this channel David Ayer's 2014 tank epic, Fury. Set in the dying embers of the Third Reich and opening a window to a treacherous world inside a Sherman tank, we follow the US Army's Second Armored on their perilous missions against an unrelenting foe. But before we begin, I will point out that the plot is almost entirely based on fiction. Did this story really ever take place at all? Was this story true or false? We'll tell you in the final moments of tonight's show. Next, the mysterious bond between a boy and his dog. And because of that, I'll be focusing my review mainly on the weapons, the strategies, and any other inconsistencies I can find along the way. Now, let us close the hatch and hunger down as we delve into today's review. This is Fury. Hailed by legendary General George Patton as Hell on Wheels, Fury focuses on the US Army's Second Armored Division, specifically the perils of a Sherman tank crew as they traverse the battlegrounds and scorched land of the once mighty Third Reich. Like the submarine classic epic Das Boot, Fury opens a window on an enclosed and dangerous world. These men battle with unfavorable odds and in horrendous conditions, crammed inside a metal box. Balancing luck and skill to survive while forging bonds of brotherhood in the unrelenting fire of war. Brotherhood? <laughs> What do you know about brotherhood? Get a load of this guy, fish. Now, by the spring of 1945, the Second Armored Division is now pushing deep into Nazi Germany. Three years prior, they'd begun the war in North Africa, where they had landed in Casablanca in late 1942. After nine months of fighting against the desert fox Erwin Rommel, the division was moved to the invasion of Sicily, where they crushed German and Italian defences. Now, having pushed the enemy back, town by town, field by field, from the banks of Normandy through France and Belgium, Berlin was finally in sight. However, accurately put by Don m o r d a d i c o l l i e r the war will end soon, but before it does, a lot more people gotta die. It's here we join the Second Armored Division. Opening on a quiet battlefield, we witness our first Nazi death of the movie. Nazi killing will be a main driver for characters in this film. Lieutenant Aldo r a i n would be proud. Nazi ain't got no humanity. And we get our first glimpse inside the confinements of a Sherman tank and the camaraderie of its crew. The camera pans across the souvenirs our crew has salvaged, and amongst the five hanging Nazi medals, We can see the cross of honor of the German mother. This medal was only given to German women who have given birth to six or more children. There was also a gold version for eight or more children. I think it's improbable the crew would have found it on a soldier, and unlikely they would have it proudly displayed if they'd taken it off a civilian woman. But still, it's an interesting detail. Soon the crew returns to an army encampment, and we discover Fury is the last survivor of five tanks from their previous mission. All taken out by a single tiger. There really was no safety in numbers. The tiger was more than capable of taking on multiple enemies. In fact, with their long range and thick armor, German Tiger tanks would prove throughout the war that one could hold of 10 or more of the American Shermans. There are a couple of small inaccuracies here. A pan across the camp shows a black soldier in the group. Later in the movie, another black soldier is sent to contact War Daddy. At this point in time, The US Army had limited integration, and the majority of black soldiers served in segregated units with white officers. A black soldier would have been a very unlikely choice for a messenger. However, I'm not upset with this choice at all. Inclusion is important, and I don't think it takes anything away from the story. 
While on the note of inclusion, with Michael Penner's addition to the tank crew, Fury is one of the first films to depict a Hispanic American serving in World War II. There were between 400 and 500,000 Hispanic Americans serving in the US Armed Forces during World War II, constituting over 3% of Army personnel, so it's great to see this representation. The second inaccuracy is when we're introduced to Norman. How long have you been in the Army? Eight weeks. In 1944, Army basic training was 12 weeks. He could not have gone through basic training, additional specialty training, even as a clerk typist, taken leave, which soldiers were granted after training, and deployed to Europe in just eight weeks. But I guess this isn't too much of a big deal. It shows Norman's unpreparedness for what he's about to enter. And this is further personified as he meets the other members of Fury's crew. Wait until you see. See what? What a man can do to another man. Sheila Booth delivers this line perfectly. In my opinion, all the actors in this film did a phenomenal job. Now up until this point, the race of war had been across allied countries, and the soldiers were predominantly treated as liberators. Cheering and glad-filled citizens would meet them on the street, sharing food and wine and often hugs and kisses. But this changed after they entered German territory. Instead of liberators, the soldiers were now an invading enemy. By now, it's clear that Germany will lose the war. Undeterred, as we're told in the opening captions, Hitler's total war is in effect, mobilizing every German man, woman, and child. From this point on, tankers and infantrymen would face the constant threat of ambush. From the moment Norman joins the Fury crew, we as an audience develop an understanding, along with him, the vulnerability of these machines. The guerrilla tactics employed by the Waffen SS and the constant sense of unease must have been terrifying for these men. At this point in the war, the German army was broken and predominantly leaning on political fanatics, namely the SS and often young children from the Hitler Youth to keep the war effort going. Before long, the column is ambushed and due to Norman's inaction, the lead tank is engulfed in flames. Tommy cookers, originally the name for portable stoves issued to the British troops. This phrase was later used as a derogatory nickname for Sherman tanks due to their tendency to catch fire when hit. This fault was first blamed on the fact that early Shermans were petrol powered, although the problem was compounded as the fire ignited the exposed shells and other munitions stowed inside. Left behind, strewn across the European countryside lay many blackened Shermans a tomb for the brave warriors whose bodies remain scorched in their seats. Here we witness this horror, and we are able to imagine what it must have been like for one of these soldiers, seeing with our own eyes, knowing it could very well be the way we also meet our end. The sheer bravery of these men is unfathomable to me. In this attack, we see the Hitler Youth use the infamous Panzerfaust, a handheld German anti-tank weapon. Known as a shaped charge, Inside is mostly hollow, allowing the cone shape to propel explosive material into a single point. The Panzerfaust was able to pierce through the light Sherman armor, spraying the inside of the troop compartment with red hot molten fragments. This demonstrates their vulnerability from an ambush, as any single man, or child for that matter, can incinerate a whole tank alone. We finally get to see our first battle, with, to be honest, less than optimal tank strategy. The anti-tank guns are firing from hidden positions and by the looks of it had the time to aim from only a few hundred meters away. This is very short range for these guns, which were highly accurate. The shots going between the tanks that are either approaching head on or backing straight up, meaning not moving laterally across the gunner's lines of sight, it's just not credible to consistently miss at those ranges. What I do like, however, is the visual effects of the tracer rounds. I don't believe it's something that has ever been done before quite like this. These rounds enable the machine gunner to lock onto its target. It reminds me of archival footage of battle assaults or dogfights over the ocean where you can see the white buzz of bullets raining from the machine guns across the arena of war. Tracers were used by all sides, each using a different colour, 
and it's great to see they've got this correct with the Allies using red tracers and the Germans green. The only issue I have is tracer bullets from 30 and 50 caliber guns don't light up until at least 50 to 100 yards beyond the muzzle of the gun. The laser like show in the movie visually is a spectacle but unfortunately not accurate. That aside this is a brilliant use of the combination of practical and CGI effects creating a visually spectacular scene. As the battle continues, we see the tank crews firing while driving forward. While this is possible and potentially sometimes necessary, both sides would train their crews to fire the cannon only when stationary. This is because bumping from the terrain could cause the cannon to lift or lower by a few inches, sending the shot miles off the intended target. With the ability to engage a standing imminent threat from range, it makes no sense to drive head on across an open field towards anti-tank weaponry. These tanks are sitting duck lined up in a row here and it's only thanks to the Germans unbelievably poor aiming ability that they escape disaster. The outskirts of this village are littered with people hung, signs dangling from their necks spelling out their crimes of cowardice. This seems to be quite a common trope of Hollywood's portrayal of the Waffen-SS brutality. It is true that throughout the last days of the Third Reich, it ruthlessly forced its desperate conscripts into service by threat of summary execution to slow the overwhelming Soviet army as it smothered Berlin. In the late 1960s, Ferdinand Schoner, the last surviving field marshal of Nazi Germany, gave a lengthy interview to Italian historian Mario Silvestri, in which he details how no mercy was given to any straggler found behind the front lines without orders. SS members, aware that they would be in for the worst of it after the war, and that their mandatory blood type tattoos would make them easy to identify, were the ones sufficiently motivated to impose this policy. I also found this quote from a resident of Berlin, recalling the horrors of the inner city at the time. Boys who were found hiding were hanged as traitors by the SS as a warning that he who was not brave enough to fight had to die. When trees were not available, people were strung up on lampposts. They were hanging everywhere, military and civilian, men and women, ordinary citizens who had been executed by a small group of fanatics. Despite this, I have been unable to locate any evidence of this happening in small villages, especially on the scale we see in the movie. More likely in small populations such as this, those refusing to fight were simply shot because of the lack of people around the area to read the signs. Interestingly, War Daddy does translate the sign incorrectly as saying, I'm a coward and refuse to fight for the German people. When actually, Ich foto mein Kinder nicht kam verlassen means I won't let my children fight in the war. It's a small error, and I'm guessing maybe made by the editor. But just get Brad to say a different line, or better yet, change the sign. Sure, most of the English speakers won't notice, but it's just lazy in my opinion. Now, the following battle scene did make me laugh out loud on first watch. Wall Daddy politely asks an old man for the location of the German soldiers, and as he obliges, some gormless German sniper makes the decision to execute him for revealing their position, which he had accomplished anyway. Never mind that he had the drop on the whole division. Why not take out one of the tank commanders when you have the chance? Seriously, what a dumbass. Unfortunately, the movie continues to employ military stupidness from this point forward for the sake of the story. Around the next corner, Fury avoids yet another anti-tank shell. Despite these blind Germans having all the time in the world to sink one right through their center and from near point-blank range. I know this might feel like nitpicking realism, but come on, Fury has got to be the luckiest tank in the whole army. As the Germans in the town surrender, we see the cautiousness of the soldiers. This would not be unfounded. Listen to this veteran's account of surrendering SS divisions breaking the rules of war. Any dirty trick they could pull on you, they would. They would give up, they would come out, headed towards us, and some of our guys, not thinking, would run out to get them. And so it's when the guys would get out there, the front guy would fall down and he'd have a machine gun strapped on his back and the two on each side of him would mow down the guys that come out to get them after they supposedly gave up. So we wouldn't take a prisoner after that. We said, don't try to give up, we're gonna kill you. We're about to come face to face with the monster of this movie, the Panzerkampfwagen 6, or better known as 
the tiger. The tiger was a beast revered for its superior firepower and strong armor. It had a crew of five like the Sherman, but was almost double its weight and size, with its outer shell an extra inch thicker and its huge 88mm cannon capable of shattering armor over a mile away. Although the Tiger did have its weaknesses, what it gained in armor, it lost in speed. The rear also had much lighter protection, meaning if the right tactics were employed, it could prove to be its Achilles heel. The Tiger's ammo was almost twice the length of the Sherman's 75mm shells, which were mostly ineffective from distance. This created the recurrent question amongst GIs of why the Allies didn't have better means to combat these Bavarian beasts. It wasn't until the first part of 1945 that the army finally delivered an answer. The M4A3E8, the last evolution of the Sherman tank and brimming with upgrades. Thicker armor, better engine and the piece de resistance. A new cannon firing a more powerful 76mm shell, capable of going 3000 feet per second faster than the previous 2200 feet per second. This most welcome improvement provided Sherman crews the muscle they had been lacking, a gun capable of penetrating the Tiger's thick hide. The M4A3E8 is the version featured as Fury. Now, for me this diminishes the upcoming Tiger battle. Even if we forget about Fury's gun for a second, the Tiger makes its first awful decision. This tank commander goes against everything taught to them by German tank school where they were taught to first shoot the tank that presented the greater threat, especially those with longer barrels like Fury 76. With the advantage of surprise from a flanking position that was presented in this scene, no doubt Fury would have been targeted first. Furthermore, conventional tank warfare tactics are to take out the lead tank, then the rear, as to block the others in the center. This is so effective it's still used in modern warfare. This guy goes straight for the one at the rear and yes, maybe we could chalk this up to an inexperienced experienced crew, but still. And one more thing. Another one. The sights on the Tiger were far superior, with a wide, 25 degree field of view in comparison to the Allied optics, which had no more than 13 degrees of view. Almost half. How much of a bonehead would the Tiger's commander have to be to not spot Fury's gun as being the only one of the four with a weapon that could cause a real threat? If the director had just made Fury the second in the column, I could forgive this. Although, I would still expect anyone fresh out of tank school to have these simple tactics drilled into their head. Now both sides throw the armoured tactics rulebook out the window. Three tanks heading directly through an open field. This is nothing short of suicidal, and given the apparent veterancy of the crews, very uncharacteristic. Let's go right out! Let's go right out! Yeah, maybe let's not, mate. The Tiger also would have been taught to only advance enough through the smoke to get a clearer shot and remain stationary while engaging. All this while keeping his frontal armour towards the enemy. Standard practice was to stop, then shoot, and stay at a distance where your cannon would be more effective than your enemies. Nevertheless, historical accuracy aside, I did enjoy this scene for its tension, and I again appreciated the traces from the tank shells. Too often in movies do we see tanks fire, then an explosion. These shells absolutely bounced across the landscape. And visually, this is excellent to see. All things considered, for the average viewer who is unfamiliar with tank tactics, this scene is exciting and beautifully shot. I would have thought it very unlikely for tanks to meet at such close quarters in real life, but the scene was edited superbly. The aerial shots in particular added deeper dimensions. And of course, we can't forget how unbelievable it is we are watching a genuine German Tiger tank traverse the fields of Europe for the first time since the war. Gotta love those practical effects. This is the final act, as the crew lonesomely roll along the countryside, approaching their final destination. They strike a landmine which removes their tracks. Firstly, Kunas believes he can fix it. Now, I don't mean to be a Dante Thomas here, but the tracks on Fury weigh more than two tons each. I'm sure any sensible crew would have known it was completely futile to try and fix badly broken tracks with only hand tools in the middle of nowhere. Tankers didn't generally carry extra track plates to fix broken tracks. They were simply welded on as an extra layer of armor. And secondly, they just hit a mine. Mines are usually set out in a field rather than just one randomly placed. The crew certainly would have known this. 
However, they don't seem to have a care in the world as they casually climb off the tank and take a stroll. The rest of the climax to this film militarily is absurd. There is no way an SS infantry company is going to continually assault a single disabled tank sitting out in the open from the front, where most of its guns are pointed and where its heaviest armour is located. The tactic, and everyone knew this by this point in the war, was to get men around the sides and hit it with a Panzerfaust. They didn't even need to get to the rear of the tank. Anything within a hundred yards is not only going to be an easy hit for these infantrymen, but will also easily penetrate the tank and probably kill most of the crew. A penetrating Panzerfaust hit in the fighting compartment would have most likely been fatal for all crew members, not just a single man who happened to be in the way of the molten metal spray. In the lead up to the final battle scene, you can see the SS battalion is carrying many of these anti-tank weapons. So it's in the movie's own reality that they would have been inundated with these shots. While we're looking at this battalion, I want to mention how amazing the costume department is. You can see that each soldier's uniform has slightly different camo. And this is very accurate. The SS had hundreds of different designs, and the crew have meticulously created these from genuine uniforms of the time. The modern combat look that we know today was really developed by the Germans. And so they, they have this vast variety of camouflage. If you look at German camouflage, you know, they probably lost the war because they had so many different kinds of uniforms. You know, maybe if they picked one. And we meticulously copied the camouflage to the best of our ability. We copied the fabric, we copied the dyes and the print and the inks and the repeat length on the pattern. It's a very unique and different army than, than anyone's ever seen before. I have to admire this level of dedication. It really shows the director cares about the history they're portraying, even with a fictional plot. I recommend watching the behind the scenes if you're interested in the great lengths the crew went to for authenticity. My final criticism, spoiler alert, after Norman has buried himself under the tank, one SS infantryman spots him and seems to show mercy by not revealing his position. Certainly there's many accounts of similar shows of compassion between opposing soldiers. Men tired of killing, look the other way as they encounter each other alone in the woods at night. I do understand the point that director and writer David Eyre wanted to make here was that not everyone in war is bad and that Norman, who by this time had developed a bloodlust of his own, needed a reminder that the soldiers on the opposite side are human too. They too can show a quantum of mercy. I just find it doubtful that in a battalion of hardened fanatic SS soldiers on their final march to protect the fatherland, and who just watched a lot of their fellow comrades slaughtered by this tank crew would go so easy on him. I'm gonna wrap it up there. I'm not gonna waste any more time dissecting this scene. It's certainly fun to watch and should be enjoyed as an exaggerated last stand by brave men. As I mentioned before, the plot of Fury is almost entirely fictitious. However, it has been influenced by real events from various accounts and memoirs. Allied tankers such as the American tank commander, Staff Sergeant Lafferty G. Paul, whom the nickname War Daddy originally belonged to. Staff Sergeant Paul landed just after D-Day and had a confirmation of 258 destroyed enemy vehicles before his tank was knocked out in late 1944. I also have two sources that I believe the last stand of the crew of the disabled Fury could be based on. There is an anecdote from Death Traps, a 1998 memoir by Belton Y. Cooper, wherein a lone tanker guarding a road junction is approached by a German infantry unit who apparently have not spotted the tank in the darkness. This unnamed tanker is said to have ricocheted shells into enemy forces, fired all his machine gun ammunition, and thrown grenades to kill German soldiers climbing onto the tank. Cooper concluded, When our infantry arrived the next day, they found the brave young tanker still alive in his tank. The entire surrounding area was littered with German dead and wounded. The second is proposed by a Reddit user who suggests the idea is based on the bravery of Lieutenant Audie Murphy of the Major Infantry Unit. In early 1945, near the village of Holtzfeer in eastern France, Lieutenant Murphy's forward position 
Frenchmen's came under fierce attack by the Germans. Against the onslaught of six panzer tanks and 250 infantrymen, Murphy ordered his men to fall back to better their defences. Alone, he mounted an abandoned burning tank destroyer and with a single machine gun contested the enemy's advance. Wounded in the leg during the heavy fire, Murphy remained there for nearly an hour, repelling the attack of German soldiers on three sides and single-handedly killing 50 of them. His courageous performance stalled the German advance and allowed him to lead his men in the counter-attack, which ultimately drove the enemy away. For this, Murphy was awarded the Medal of Honor, the United States' highest award for gallantry in action. Overall, I really enjoyed watching this movie. The high audience and critic scores on IMDb and Rotten Tomatoes are definitely not unfounded. Visually stunning, gripping action scenes, and I have to admire the level of dedication to historical realism, outside of some of the tactics of course. Let's go right out, let's go right out. Shot predominantly in the United Kingdom as to replicate the weather of April 1945, while also having the availability of working World War II era tanks. It's a marvel to see these machines on screen, with the production borrowing four genuine Sherman tanks and unbelievably the last surviving fully operational German Tiger tank. All of which were kindly lent by the Tank Museum in Bovington, UK, where you can see these same mighty beasts on exhibit to this day. With the story and history covered, I want to say the cast performances are fantastic. Pitt's crew members are a believable motley band of brothers. You really feel they're truly ground down by war and suffering from hardcore PTSD, but still somehow functioning and doing their jobs. One thing that's consistent in Frontline Veterans memoirs is their recollections of just how filthy everything was after fighting on the line for a few weeks, and they really looked the part. I also liked how unflinching the movie was when showing their attitudes towards fighting. By this point in the war, most veteran soldiers were hardened killers, and Fury doesn't shy away from this. In my honest opinion, Fury is a noble bid at depicting the horrors of war, and well worth watching for any war movie enthusiast. And finally, today, Fury has pleased the Shogun, and will give this film a respectable score of... 78%, and is the first film to be added to the Shogun rankings. If you made it this far, I just want to say how grateful I am for your support. If you have any comments, criticisms or questions, or if you have an idea of a historical movie you'd like to hear the real story behind, please put it all in the comments section below. I promise to read and hopefully reply to anything I receive. If you enjoyed this episode, please help the Shogun grow his empire by liking and subscribing. Ciao, minasan, chikai wa tanoshimi. Kyotsukete ne, sayonara.